So we're thrilled to have with us today Dr. Pablo Simon Lorda, uh, who is a professor at University of Granada in Spain, and he is also a member of the National Bioethics Commission of Spain. Uh, and uh, he is uh, uh, here at Columbia as a visiting professor for a few months, and we're very fortunate to have him here. Uh, he, as a physician, works on end-of-life care issues. And of course, end-of-life care is very important, uh, as we know from uh, Sarah Palin's comments about death panels and uh, President Obama's, uh, the newly elected President Obama's Affordable Care Act, and uh, his initial plan to encourage doctors to talk about uh, advanced care planning. That was taken off the table. But these remain big, big issues, and every country deals with them differently, and so it's very important to see how other countries deal with these issues, and so we're honored and thrilled oh. to have Dr. Lourdes with us uh, today. So please <laughs> So thank you so much. Firstly, I want to give thanks to Professor Klisman uh, for this opportunity to share with you, uh, well, uh, the development of uh, end-of-life uh, decision-making in Spain. I mean, this is an important topic that uh, should be also of interest for you, because you can compare what we are doing and how we are dealing with these problems with the situation in the US. So I mean, it will be interesting for you. Secondly, I also want to, to say that uh, I am also very grateful to Professor Ron Bayer, that is, uh, well, now I am working on um, public health ethics, so I am moving from clini clinical ethics to public health ethics, that is a different topic, and in fact, I am here because he uh, agreed uh, to admit me as a visiting professor here. And finally, I want to say that I am a bit anxious <laughs> because I am a bit shy <laughs> and because uh, I think that you are a very clever and uh, intelligent people knowing a lot about bioethics and um, because uh, I mean that my English is not so good so I am a bit worried about this but I will try to do the best <laughs> trying to communicate you some ideas about how is uh, this topic in, uh, in Spain? First of all, I want to say that uh, probably, probably you know that uh, Spain is a member of the European Union. We, we are about uh, 46 million people. Uh, we are a parliamentary monarchy, like many other countries in Europe. This is a political system quite special, but uh, this is the, the reality. And I have to say that, and this is important for my my, my talk because, uh, in fact, Spain now is a quasi-federal state because we are divided in 17 regions that uh, have, a, I mean, quite a lot of autonomy for many decisions. Uh, well, mm, our surface is similar, it's between Texas and California. So we are not a very big country, but uh, we are mm, one of the, of the biggest countries in Europe. Um, we have, until now, a national healthcare system quite similar to, where, to what you are going uh, with uh, Obamacare. I'm not sure about that, but this is what we have until now because the new government is introducing reforms, um, for example, for the universal coverage that until now was around 99% of the people uh, was covered by the uh, state system that is financed by taxes, and, um, but also is at the same time decentralized, uh, for example, the, the health care in the 17 regions. Um, uh, around 9% nine, nine of our GDP is, uh, uh, deals with the uh, cost of the health care. So it's not, it's not very high. I mean, it's, it's quite uh, it's in the medium of the European countries. Our results, in, uh, I mean that our results in terms of health are quite good. Our fertility rate is quite low, but the life expectancy is very high. It's probably one of the highest in Europe, about uh, 83 years old for women and 76 uh, years for men. The main causes, causes of death are diseases of the circulatory system, the malignant neoplasm, and the disease of the respiratory system, quite similar to most of the developed countries. So I have given you 
I, sorry, I have given you uh, this case. This case is not a European case, it's not a Spanish case, it's, it's uh, a case from the United States. It's quite old. It was issued in, in the JAMA in 1988. I mean that uh, you have had the opportunity to read it. And, um, well, this, this case, when it was issued in the JAMA, produced a great debate uh, with a lot of letters um, uh, discussing the case. No? So, well, you, 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 you have the paper and you can read it, the paper, but uh, if you have uh, got the opportunity to read it, I, I would like to ask you to try to put a name, to name this axiom. What is this uh, internal, this intern is doing? What, what is doing this doctor? And here you have a list of things. So those you have read the case, what do you think he's doing? Um, I guess, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know if this is right, but um, I would call it euthanasia, like active euthanasia, I guess. Active euthanasia, well, okay. I think in this case, and I'm, I'm in favor of physician-assisted suicide, but I think in this case it was homicide. Homicide, okay. Four ideas. Yep. Yeah. I'll call it palliative sedation. Palliative sedation. More ideas? Okay, okay. Um, I'm just getting a chance to like quickly read through it, but it looks like um, similar things that we do in hospice care today. Hospice care, palliative care, I mean. Yeah. Okay, you, you could call it good clinical practice at the end. Might be a good clinical practice for you, this. Um, for me personally, I need to research what the effects of uh, morphine are on my conscious state, but um, I think it's okay. I mean, I think it is okay clinical practice. Okay. So, well, it's enough. You can think. But you can see active euthanasia, homicide, palliative sedation, good clinical practice. Four different names with four different... Um, ethical dimensions and legal consequences. So this is the, the problem. I, I mean, you also have the problem. Death panels uh, interpreted as, for me, from Europe, your, the panels of the Obamacare were uh, advanced care planning. But for, for the Republicans were death panels, youth in Asia. So this is the problem with which we are we have been fighting in Spain and Europe. I, I, I mean that also in the United States is about the names of the things, of the actions. Because behind the names, there are moral decisions or and legal consequences about this. So, in fact, uh, we have been uh, having uh, a debate in Spain uh, about these topics uh, since uh, the, uh, for, for 40 years, um, and between also, uh, you know that we, we had a civil war and we have a, a dictatorship uh, uh, between 1940 and 1978 when uh, democracy arrived in Spain. We also had a debate about these points. But of course, the most important of the last, and I am going to explain you how was the debate about how to differentiate these and which are the moral consequences and the legal consequences of two, uh, these different actions. I am going to speak about law. And I, I have to say that although I am going to speak about legal regulations, in fact, I am not a lawyer. I am not interested in, la in laws. But laws, um, uh, behind the laws, there are ethical decisions values and ethical con considerations that this is the point that I am interested in, in fact. Not in the, not in the law, but in what, what is behind the law. So although I am going to speak a lot about law, I, in fact I will be speaking about ethics. This is important. You know that, uh, for example, in Southern Europe, in the countries of the Latin area, the law is very important because 
regulations, uh, self-regulation, ethical regulation has been not well developed. So many times we develop uh, regulations direct, directly through the law. Well, one very important point was the Constitution. The Constitution includes the constitutional right to life and to not suffer inhuman or, degrad or, de or degradant treat, and this was very important, because you, you can see here there are two sides of the, of, the, of the right, the right to life, but also the right not to suffer uh, inhuman or degradant trait. And the other very important value right was the constitutional right to freedom and the free development of the person. So these values, these constitutional rights, are behind many of our debates how to uh, balance these two values. And there is a very important decision of the Constitutional Court that is exactly the same to your Supreme Court, because it, this, uh, uh, it, the, the, uh, this, this court is, um, uh, uh, has to interpret uh, the Constitution, about uh, a very important hunger strike that we suffered in the, uh, in the 90s in Spain. It was a hunger strike of prisoners that were members of a terrorist group named Grapo. And the, and the debate was uh, if we have to enforce the feeding of the prisoners, to, uh, not to allow them to die. So it was the debate. And the conclusion of the constitution of the court was that um, there is a right to life, but there is not an obligation to life. This is important because open the door to the refusal of treatment. And this not obligation to life is protected also by the right to freedom. And this for all the citizens in general, but not for prisoners. This is, there is an exception with prisoners because the prisoners are under the protection of the state and so there is also a, a cut in the development of this right so they can be enforced to feeding. No? So there is a general, but also there is an exception with prisoners. I have to say that this, I disagree with this, but this is not the case now. So, but this was very important in the 90s. Well, previously, in 1986, we had the first chart of rights of the patients. You have here in the States the first chart were developed around the 70s, but we had to wait until 1986 to uh, find this in Spain. For example, this chart included all the question of informed consent, the refusal of treatment, but not including, for example, nothing about living wills, about advanced directives, and this is very important, was not very clear about substitute decision making. So this was a, a great problem, but at least we had the first chart uh, dealing with these aspects that were complete, I have to say, that were completely unknown in the hospitals because the atmosphere in the uh, Spanish hospitals at this time was very paternalistic. So it was quite new to introduce the right to informed consent in the hospitals in Spain. Well, uh, in 1995, arise a new penal code, and this was very important because for end of life, because uh, it was a new article, the article <coughs> 143 of the new penal code, that in the fourth paragraph introduces a um, regulation of a special type of actions. You can see the first says, uh, is regulation, re regulating the induction to suicide. This is a criminal, a criminal action. The second is regulating the uh, cooperation. The third is very strange. It's very strange because it's way. So how can I cooperate reaching the level of producing the death? So how can I suicide other? So it's really strange. But most important is the fourth. Because not using, not, not using the word euthanasia, it was describing what, what most of us interpreted 
as interpret as euthanasia. So direct as to the death of another person by the express request, serious and inequivocal of this one in case of the victim suffered a serious disease that would lead necessarily to, to his her death or that produced serious suffering, permanent and difficult to support, will be punished with the, and this is the point, with inferior sentence prison. So it, it, it is a criminal act, but it's not as serious as others. So this is the reason why the punish is slower, is lower than others. So this was very important because, uh, well, first, in fact, this article in Spain has been only applied one time, one time. And it was in 2009. It was really an act of euthanasia by this doctor. But I have to say that the, the great debate in Spain was about what is regulating, regulating this article. Because uh, for many people, it just was referred to what we call euthanasia, active, direct, and voluntary acts. For, but for many other people, it was not, it was not so clear that also can be included in the article other things like passive euthanasia, dealing with omissions, the debate about withhold, withdraw, what we call now limitation of futile. Fut you say futile or futile? Either one. Either one. Okay. Futile treatments, the indirect euthanasia that now we call palliative sedation, of the, even the co cooperation with society. The debate in Spain from 1995 until uh, 2010, and later we will see why this, uh, this year, has been dealing with this problem. Not only in Europe, we have, not only in Spain, we have this problem. Because for example, here you have a resolution of the Council of Europe, that is a very important is European institution, and you can see is, this is a very important resolution about advanced directives and living wills. And you can see this resolution is not intended to deal with the issues of euthanasia or assisted suicide. And then gives a definition. Euthanasia in the sense of the intentional killing by act or omission. Really, I don't know how can you kill others by omission. Because if you, if you are telling me that he's refusing the treatment, so this is the reason why you are not giving the treatment, then this is a refusal of treatment, and that's all. And, and if you are not giving the treatment, and you should be giving the treatment because it is well indicated, then this is not an euthanasia but or by omission. It is not good clinical practice. Even you can say that this is an homicide or, but not euthanasia by omission. So this is the, the problem we have uh, with, with words. Well, in Spain, there is a very important case that opened the debate to all the society. Because until now, this was mainly a question, a debate um, of lawyers, uh, special moral philosophers, doctors. but. This case opened the debate to all the society. Do you know the name of this guy? He's Ramon San Pedro. Probably you don't know him, but if I put this, son of you, have you watched this movie? Okay, the scene inside, you know, Javier Bardem, oh, he's so handsome. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the story of Ramon San Pedro. So Ramon San Pedro uh, was, a, was a, a person that he was uh, quadri tetraplegic, quadri, how you say, quadriplegic. He was paralyzed, but he was not dependent of mechanical ventilation. This was important. He was completely capable. And at one moment, he asked, I want to die, and I need help to die. So please allow some doctor to give me some drug to produce me the death. This, this was the point. And it was a great debate in Spain. Well, it, the, the debate was so intense that at the end produced a movie. So it was very important. But I always say that in this, in this picture, for me, 
The important persons, of course, is he, but there are other very important persons in this picture. And are these, who are them? The press, the journalists. Because this was the first time that this was a very intense debate in Spain about this topic. So you, you know what, that if, if you have watched the, the movie, you know that at the end he commits suicide. Uh, uh, because he, uh, even he, even he, um, he produced a video that is uh, later, you, you can see it, uh, how, how he is dying. It's, it's terrible, the, the, the video. Um, okay, in 1996 it was passed. This is important if you if you want to understand some of the things that, that are, are happening around bioethics in Europe, you have to uh, you have to read this very important document because uh, it's the, the, we call it the Oviedo Convention uh, because it's the um, it's, it is the base the basement for the development development of many regulation on bioethical question clinical and also research questions in Europe. So Spain ratified the convention on January of 2000, and this was very important because this convention, when you sign and ratify the convention, as country you are obliged to adapt your leg legislation to the content of this convention. So we had to introduce changes in our law, for example, in the chart of rights of patients of, 19, of 1986. We were obliged to do this. For example, to introduce advanced directives and proxy, and proxy decision making. So the result was a new law that is very important because now it's the main law regulating uh, many decisions, many clinical decisions in Spain. And this law introduced, well, clearly, again, informed consent the right to refuse treatment, but also putting clear the substitute decision making, the proxy decision making, and things like, like advanced directives. I am going to tell you some things about proxy decision making because I mean it's important to show you that the situation, I mean, the situation in Spain now is quite similar to the United States. So this law regulates three situations in, in which we have to uh, do proxy consent. Is the first of all is, with, I have translated it as incapable de facto. So I, I don't know how is this here is. He is now incapable. Incapable de facto, you use this expression? Yes. yes, okay. Incapable de facto. The second is a legally incapacitated patient. This, is, this needs a judge, the, a court decision. And the third is a minor, not mature, but well, we have problems with this. Well, in these situations, who decides? Well, in the first, if advanced directive exists, then the designated proxy. This. And in second term, the family. If there is no advanced directive, then it's the family. For example, I, I know, I, I remember that 10 years ago, I was reading the New York State task force that was regulating this. And, and now it's quite similar to what uh, uh, the situation in Spain. Well, in the case of a legally incapacitated, you say the tutor? No? How is the, the person that is designated by the judge to decide? How is the name of this in English? Guardian. The guardian. I was thinking the, the, the word. I'm sorry. OK. And the minor? The parents. OK? Well, and how decides? Well, the law only speaks about two criteria. So the first is the advanced directive or subject is a standard. So if there is a, 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 an advanced directive, you have to follow the instructions of the advanced directive, even you are the proxy. But this law doesn't regulate the substitute judgment standard. There is no mention in this law to this and introduce the best interest standard. So if there is no possibility to know, uh, uh, to know the desires of the decisions of the patient, then we have to apply what is, well, mentioned the best interest standard, that I mean that you also in the US use. 
This is important because, for example, you know that the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom, the law, in fact, only applies the best interest standard. So, at the end, if there is no advanced directive, directly, uh, the family can, uh, sorry, uh, we have to establish the best interest standard, but in the UK, who is really uh, deciding what is the best interest is not the family, are the doctors by law. So, I mean, the, in the UK, in the United Kingdom, remains a sort of paternalism in this area. That is really surprising. Knowing the development of the uh, of the British uh, society. Well, also, this law introduced the, the advanced directives. They are written documents. They are made by competent persons of legal age. Well, they, mm, they are done to express wishes, to express wishes in relation, in relation with the destiny of the body of the organs and to appoint a proxy. Quite similar to the United States, I mean. But th this is important point because there are many differences in Europe around this. In many European countries, now there are advanced directives, but there are a lot of differences about the binding effect of these documents. For example, in France, advanced directives really are not binding for doctors. They can discuss the, the, the content of the advanced directive. Um, but in Spain, um, they can, they, there are some exceptions. If they are against the law, for example, a patient has put, I want euthanasia. And although the, this is in the, in the advanced directive, you cannot follow this because this is in the criminal code. So this is a criminal action. You can, a doctor cannot do that. He's not obliged to, to do that. Should be, should be <laughs> without sense to do that. If they are, and, and this is important. For the discussion about futility that we, we, will, we will look after, if they are contrary to the Lex Artis, good clinical practice. So this is an exception that has two sides. Because you, have, you can do a very paternalistic interpretation of this, but it's also an open door to discuss about futility cases. When, for example, here, you know the, the Wangley case in the United States? The Wangley case is a case here, you had this case, in, in which a woman had put in the advanced directive, I want everything forever. And this went to court. I don't, I don't know the state. So this is a problem. Because which is the balance between the designs of the patients in an advanced directive and the opinion of the doctors about futility? of some things. So this is an open door here in Spain to this. Well, in the case, if the case is not clearly described in the document. Well, maybe freely revoked. And uh, in Spain, we have registries. So if you do an advanced directive, then you have to uh, put in, uh, in a registry. Uh, this is, uh, in fact, in Spain now, there are 70 registries, but they are coordinated. So they are, in fact, they are, uh, they are files. Uh, and this allows us to know exactly the number of advanced directives that there are in Spain. And they are very few, very low. So the use of advanced directives in Spain is very low. This is the, uh, yesterday arrived me, uh, um, they gave me the, the last number. It's November 2012, exactly that number. Very, very low, very low. Why? Because probably in Spain, even today, although we have all these regulations, most of the persons prefer to leave the decision in the hands of the family. And that's all. So, one problem with this law of 2002, the capacity has to be evaluated by the attendant doctor of the patient, who can consult other colleagues, usually psychiatrists, but there is no criteria, no criteria in the law to guide the decision. So it's completely open. This is a, a decision by the professionals. 
Okay, this was the situation in 2002. Well, the debate was how to apply, how to, so, so how to use all this, uh, this law to decide in end-of-life cases. This was the debate in Spain, it, and it was not so clear. Um, but there was a lot of interest. Af after Ram the Ramon San Pedro case, the interest in, uh, in, this, in, uh, in Spain about end-of-life uh, decision has been very, very high, very, very high. For example, we, all the Spanish people, follow it completely the case of Terry Chiavo. So the impact of the Terry Chiavo case in Spain was very high, was very high. And the debate was uh, really in the, in the journals. In the journal. Every day we had news about what, how is going on the case of Terry Chiavo in the United States. So every, every day we, we had news about this. And for example, there was a, uh, an important debate about this movie do you remember this movie? This movie, uh, this is the movie Million Dollar Baby. And do you know that at the end of the movie, if you have not watched the movie, you should. Uh, at the end of the movie, there is an act that is an euthanasia. Not exactly. Later we will see why. But and so this was also very commented in in Spain. But then we had really our first own second own important case. The first was Ramon San Pedro. The second was this. This was a hospital, the Hospital Severo Ochoa de Leganés. This is a, a small city close to Madrid. And then uh, the doctors, they were doing palliative sedation. But then there was, uh, they were sued. They went uh, um, sued by uh, some persons. and. Uh, they were sued because th they told that they were committing euthanasia, again, the problem of the wars. And this was a very important debate mm, with uh, deep consequence because it produces that uh, palliative sedation that was at the beginning, it was not very, very used in Spain until that moment. Then uh, many doctors became uh, scared of the use of palliative sedation, and they began not to do palliative sedation. And you can see it was three years of debate about this case. At the end, uh, they were not found, the, the doctors were not found guilty. So, and the court decided that it was fine. It was good clinical practice. Uh, we have also music concerts to support uh, this. Uh, this is the, well, the, the concert. In, but this is the main case. This is the third important case. And, and you will see that it's quite similar to some of your cases. This is the case of Immaculada Echevarria. Well, this case is Im interesting because uh, Immaculada Echevarria lived in Granada, in the city where I am. Uh, she was a woman with progressive muscular dystrophy, with a spinal atrophy, and he was dependent on mechanical ventilation. At what moment? So she had been on mechanical ventilation since 1997 until 2006. And then uh, she decided to ask uh, the withdrawal of the mechanical ventilation. But using, again, the problem with the words, using the word euthanasia, euthanasia so she said, I want to be sedated and disconnected of the mechanical ventilation. I want euthanasia. So she's not obliged to use correctly the word, but you can imagine. So how, when this arrived to papers and begins again the debate. Um, well, she was completely capable. Uh, her capacity was evaluated by two independent uh, psychiatrists. And, and then she asked, uh, uh, well, uh, she refused uh, the, the treatment. Well, this case went to the Regional Bioethics Committee on Andalusia. I was there. I was one of the members. And our opinion as committee is that the Immaculada request is not euthanasia. Her request is just a treatment refusal, a revocation of consent to receive mechanical ventilation. 
and the withdrawal of mechanical ventilation is not contrary to ethics at the request of a patient acting freely, well informed, and with enough capacity to decide. Then also there is another body that was the, 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 the Ministry of Health, the Regional Ministry of Health, sent the case to the, to the Bioethics Committee. And other body, that is this one, is a, a body of consultation about legal questions. Well, it is uh, the, the members of this body are usually are very academic, uh, important professors of law. Their decisions are not binding. But if, the, if this body says um, we, we, we don't find any problem with this, then probably uh, there will be no problem in the, in the legal area. So they said Immaculada's request of withdrawal of the mechanical ventilation is not contrary to law. And healthcare professionals who will disconnect the ventilation should not be prosecuted. So this, this was the, the decision. It, it, this was very important. So Immaculada was sedated and disconnected from the mechanical ventilation. Also, as you can see here in the United States, with a lot of people it, uh, in the front of the hospital with uh, uh, shouting life and all this, well, you know, all these questions. It was exactly the same in Spain. And well, the impact of this case in the journals was very important in Spain. For example, El País, you know, El País is a, the main journal of uh, Spain. In fact, it is, uh, it, they, they have an agreement with the New York Times and many of the things that the New York Times is uh, issuing, they, they are also issued in, the, in El País and, and, and so on. And there was a very intense debate in Spain about, about this case. And many bodies uh, give their opinion. For example, this is very important because this was the Catholic Church. This was an, uh, a center of the Catholic, Catholic University of Valencia. And the, the debate was exactly the same as ever. So, Immaculata Echevarria, euthanasia or limitation, limitation of treatment? So, again, the same. Do you know this case? This case of, is of the last month in Queens. You know, so this is uh, a situation quite similar to Immaculada Echevarria. But this, this woman had a, I mean, it, she, she had a brain tumor. And she was probably almost terminal. And at the moment, she decides to be dis disconnected of the mechanical ventilation. And here comes a, de a debate about the if, if she was or not capable to decide, and if her decides were this or not. But at the end, I, I don't know if you have watched this video. It, it is in, in YouTube. You should watch it, because this is a short video where a cousin of this girl, of this woman, is asking her desires. But do you want to designate your father, that this is a very important priest, and the, the father of this woman, very important priest, that is against the disconnection of, of the mechanical ventilation. He's asking her, but uh, why don't you agree uh, with designating your father as your proxy. And finally, the, the woman says, yes, 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 I agree, I agree. So I don't want to be disconnected. And this has been employed in the court, so to mm, not to disconnect this woman. But if you watch the video, I mean, it's, it's quite scary. Because the way uh, her cousin is asking her, I don't know if she's completely free. Should, should be interesting if you can watch the video. You can see the. Oof. Okay, this is just to put that, that the, the cases are quite similar. Your, your debates and our are, are quite similar. Well, in 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 two in two thousand and seven, um, I am going on, so you can see. Uh, this was very important because one of the debates, usually in end of life decision, is about. Well, you are, you are mm, talking about of this, but uh, you have not supporting people really because you are not giving them good, palli good palliative care. 
So the question of palliative care is always on the table. And in 2007, the Federal Minister of Health um, developed the first plan to, to develop, uh, put on the, the first plan um, to develop the palliative care in all Spain. Um, many regions have developed uh, palliative care, but this was a coordinated action to develop palliative care in all the regions on the state. Now, the situation, I mean, five years later is quite good. I, can, I have to say that palliative care now in, in Spain is quite developed and it's quite similar, probably not as good as in the United Kingdom or Belgium or um, Denmark or or the Netherlands, but I, I mean it's quite, quite good. Because we continue to, to debate this until the end. But at least in all this process, the Spanish society has reached a, a point that I mean is interesting. It's in this list we can separate, separate these two actions to the other. They are not the same. These actions, well, can, you can say that can be regulated by this basic law, but it's not very clear because the, the Immaculada Echevarria case shows that it was not so clear, which are the differences between refusal of treatment, limitation of treatment, how to apply the right to refuse, it was not so clear. But uh, as an assisted suicide, we can say that it's clearly re regulated by the penal code, and this is a decision of the Central Parliament. But um, some regional parliaments decided that uh, because the regulation of these areas uh, was not so clear, was not so clear, these areas was not so clear in this law, they could develop their own laws. And this was made in first time by Andalusia. Andalusia, in this region who had suffered the case of Immaculada Echevarria and the debate of, of, of this case, decided to uh, put in force this, uh, this law to regulate of the, all these areas. The law, this law of Andalusia, uh, do some important questions. For example, the, uh, gives a clear definition of what should be uh, named uh, euthanasia. And euthanasia for this law are actions that uh, has these uh, conditions. Um, they cause the death of patients that is directly and intentionally by means of a single immediate cause, cause effect relationship are carried out at express and informant request repeated over time of competent patients are carried out in a context of suffering considered unacceptable by the patient due to an incurable disease that has not been successfully mitigated by other means, for example, by palliative care, and are performed by healthcare professionals. So this law thinks that euthanasia is a typical thing, uh, typical action of professionals. This is the reason why, for example, in Spain, we would not say that the action you can see in the movie a million dollar baby is not exactly an euthanasia because it is done by the friend of the of the main character of the of the woman but the other conditions for example the action in million dollar baby uh, really um, pass these these conditions and the law says, in light of this criteria, no action should be labeled euthanasia unless they fall into the preceding categories. Refusal of treatment, limitation of measures for life support and palliative sedation should not, however, be regard regarded as acts of euthanasia. The term does not appear in the current criminal code. However, article, this article of said code does include mention of the situation for a form of aided or induced suicide by means of an exception, exceptional subcategory. The law of, of uh, Andalusia does not regulate euthanasia. So, um, the law of Andalusia is not regulating, regulating euthanasia, but I have to say that euthanasia is something that 
now in Spain has a considerable uh, support by the people. For example, this is an opinion poll of, of the young people of between these years. And you can see, for example, regardless of what you could personally do, tell me whether you are for or against helping a terminally ill person to die if they ask for it. And they are for the 76% of the young people. But in the general polls of general population, today in Spain around 60% of, of the people would support a legal regulation of euthanasia for some clinical situations, but the support of assisted suicide is, around, is, is lower. It's around 40%. Why this difference? Because I, I mean that in, United, in the United States should be a Exactly the contrary. No, here the support of euthanasia, so so, but in fact you have two states that have passed regulation of assisted suicide. And why the difference? Can you hear? Um, I think I think that you're talking about the difference between the United States and the U.S. Um, so like with assisted suicide, your Making the dis or you're like you're asking for it. Someone's helping you do it, yeah. as opposed to euthanasia. They're doing it to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, this is the point. So, in, in the United States, for you, the consideration of, of autonomy is so important, that, and then you you have to preserve autonomy until the end. So, you have to take the drugs. So, if you are taking the drugs, this is your problem. This is your decision in some aspects. But in Europe, this is not so important. So because we have to consider, but many, for example, in Spain, many, many people should be scared about, about the idea of taking the drugs by their own. So they prefer the help of a health care. But here in the States, not. You prefer to preserve the freedom and the autonomy until the end. This is a warranty of this, as assisted suicide. I mean, this is the difference. And I have to say that probably many people in Spain really doesn't understand clearly what is assisted suicide. I have to say also this. Well, Andalusia started, but then two other regions have developed similar laws. And a draft of a basic uh, law, a federal law, was prepared and went to the parliament in 2011, but then we uh, went on elections. And so now this draft, probably the new government, that is a conservative government, is, has decided not to continue with the debate of this draft. So probably the regulation this type of regulations probably will remain in these three regions for a lot of time. And we will not have a federal regulation. I mean, it is a pity, but this is the situation. So of all the contents, I am going just to refer to this point, because I mean, this is m the most interest. And you can probably the debate uh, about uh, what is fut futility is quite similar uh, we have the same problems that you have, probably. I am going to try to show you this. Before, for example, the Andalusia, before that, uh, the, the law, this law, this is the law of Andalusia, uh, do some important uh, questions. For example, includes uh, criteria to establish the capacity of people. And if you if you are familiar with the, the mm, these criteria standards, you will find something interesting. If the patient has so you have to evaluate if the patient has difficulty in comprehending information. I am going to leave this. If the patient does not use the information in a logical way during the decision making process, if the patient fails to appreciate the possible outcome of different alternatives and if the patient is unable to milk to make a final decision 
some idea about um, where this criteria are coming from? Are you familiar with the, the standards to evaluate capacity of patients? No? These are the, the standards of Applebaum. This, 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 and this. These are the f more famous and more important standards to evaluate capacity that we have. And we have also add this one that is deals with memory. This comes from the law of the, United, of the United Kingdom. So we have five standards now in Andalusia to evaluate capacity of patients. But uh, starting with, with utility, I am going, I am ending my presentation. Question, is a doctor obliged ethically, uh, legally, to withdraw a treatment which she considers futile for the recovery of his or her patient when it is refused by a, comp a competent patient, an incompetent patient with an advanced directive where he or she refuses the treatment, or the proxy family of an incompetent without advanced directive? Is he obliged to withdraw? Yes or no? Your opinion? I mean, it's quite clear. The doctor thinks it is futile, and the patient doesn't want. So easy. OK, this is easy. I mean, although some doctors can, ha can have problems with this, because they think that, for example, if the point is to uh, disconnect a, a mechanical ventilation, can think, but this is producing death. So although I think it's not indicated and, it, and, and the patient doesn't want it, I cannot do that. So we, we can have problems with this. But in general, now it's clear that it's in Spain. But what about this? Is a doctor obliged ethically and legally to withdraw a treatment which he considers futile for the recovery of his or her patient, but is asked by a competent patient, an incompetent patient with an advanced directive where he or she asks for the treatment or the proxy family of an incompetent without advanced directive? What would you say? Yes. I think you have to have a good ethics committee in the hospital. So, oh, I don't know. I'm going to the, com the, to the ethics committee. Yes, 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 you talk, you talk. And, and, you, and, you, and you use all your tools, your communicative and emotional tools to try to convince that. No. Okay. Uh, this is not so easy. Third, is a doctor obliged legally to initiate a treatment which she considers futile for the recovery of his or her patient when the treatment is refused by a competent patient and incompetent with an advisor where he refused for the proxy? Yes or no? Quite clear. No. In Spain, this is now very clear. This is now very clear. The last, is a doctor obliged ethically to initiate a, futi a futile treatment when the treatment is asked by a competent patient, an incompetent patient, da, 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 da. So I think it's not indicated, but they are asking me to put the treatment. What did you say? I think no, but it should be Mm, a troubling question for many people. Yeah? Well, I mean, I, I think it's a very troubling question. I think it comes up a lot. And I'm interested in if there's a difference in Spain and in the U.S. Um, but just to initiate a treatment. I think well, I think there's a lot of discussion here, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I am going to try, what, what I am trying to show you is that uh, these, are, these are the problems we have. And the law in Andalusia, Navarra, and Aragon are trying to give more clear answers to this to help the doctors to feel safe when they are taking these decisions. So this, this is the point. So the law is saying you can decide 
uh, you can decide even, I am going to, to say a strong question, against the desires of a patient or against the opinion of a family if you clearly consider that this is a futile treatment. This is the point that the law of Andalusia is putting on the table. But this al is also your problem. So I recommend, this is a very interesting paper. It's the Mayo Clinical Proceedings if of one month ago, I mean. So very good, very good. It's like, it's discussing two, two cases of the United States, the case of Barnes, Barnes, and the case of Baby Joseph. You remember the, the case of Baby, baby jo Joseph? This was a small child in Canada, and they came here because you don't know where. This is, this is very important because it's, it is about proxy decision making in case of futility. So important. Well, what, what is doing the Andalusian law? It's doing this. First, it's giving a definition. What is this? Lim limitation of thera therapeutic efforts is th the term that is very common in, in, in U Europe and in Spain. I prefer limitation of futile treatment. But this is the, the term. And the most important question comes here. So the decisions about futility are decisions that are taken by the clinicians. This is the first important question. So also adds, uh, well, some definition. And this is also important because this is a, a term that is, uh, I, I mean that in the United States is not, uh, is not usual, but it's very usual in Europe, and it's very usual in Spain. Therapeutic obstinacy. Do you know what's this? It's exactly the opposite. It's a saying that not, not limitate, not, do not withdraw or withhold futile treatment. So it's exactly what, um, what is happening when a doctor uh, or when uh, a doctor is using treatments that are futile okay this is the the, the term that uh, that we use and this is the article that is regulating the, the uh, limitation of treat the limitation of, fu of futile treatment and you can see how how strong are the words because it says the doctor in charge of each patient must engage in good clinical practice by limiting their therapeutic efforts when the clinical situation so dictates, avoiding therapeutic obstinacy. Must, eh? said limitation must be justified in the clinical record. Such limitations shall be exercised after seeking the professional opinion of the nurse in charge of the patient and must be seconded by at least one other physician involved in the patient's care. Why this? Because the problem with, the, with futility is, the, is that can be very subjective. So this is a mechanism to save the subjectivity of the judgment about futility. Because I can decide, oh, I mean this is not working put it off. But this is not the point. How is, mm, how is this law regulating this? I have to say that to write this, we read a lot the Texas regulation. Okay? Well, the names of these professionals together with their opinions shall be entered into the <coughs> clinical record. No less, the attendant physician, together with other healthcare personnel caring for the patient, are required to provide any healthcare interventions needed to warranty the patient's care and comfort. And also, there is an article about healthcare ethics committees. If disagreements arise, the healthcare ethics committee, I am jumping, may propose. And this is the difference with the Texas regulation. Because for the, you know, for the Texas regulation, the decision of the ethics committee is binding. 
but we consider that the decisions of the ethics committee are not binding. What is binding really is the decision of the professionals when they, when they are doing an uh, integral process that should be something like this. Evaluate the clinical situation, including pregnancies and effectiveness of the life support measures. Evaluate the opinion of the patient and the proxies. Explore values, desires, beliefs, feelings. Check the opinion of the nurse team. Check the opinion of the other doctors. Decide if, in your opinion, it is a case of utility. Get a concurring opinion of, a, of, of at least other doctor. Communicate your decision to the patient family proxies. Give the opportunity to express, express opinions and feelings. Give time. Negotiate progressive uh, steps for withdrawals, but putting in clear that the treat treatments will be withdrawn. Proceed with the limitation. Register all the process in the clinical re record. This is the normal process. And in case of conflict, give more time, more information, more emotional support, consult the healthcare ethics committee, but the decision of the committee is not binding. In all the healthcare, if all the healthcare professionals and the ethics committee agree with the futility judgment, then you can proceed. You do not need to go to court, although the patient or the proxies can do. So, this is what this law is regulating the fertility, how, how this law is regulating the fertility decisions. So the idea should be to be able to change this into this. So this should be the, the idea, to give support to the doctors that are doing this. Well, this is my last slide. What is Andalusia doing now? Well, Andalusia now is doing research, asking this, because, uh, well, the law is, uh, can be an interesting tool, but there is no warranty that this tool will help to get better with the quality of the care on, and on life decisions. So we are doing, we are doing because I am involved in some research about this, and also we have developed this because we think that law is an important tool, but it, it is not enough. So we have done an, what we call a strategic plan of bioethics for the entire region, trying to help doctors, nurses, patients, ethics committees, families, to be more and more involved in the uh, bioethic debate and in the bioethic um, bioethics uh, de de decision making. So we think that probably also this will help to increase the quality of death in Andalusia, but I cannot give you no results about this, but I hope to do it in for coming months, or even years, and to invite you to come to Granada. I don't know if you you have been there. So we have a very interesting monument. This is the Alhambra Palace. And we have mountains with the snow. This is a palace uh, built by the Muslims in the uh, 13th, 14th century. And is one, and, and is the uh, most visited monument in Spain. So I know that Many of you, when you go to Spain, you go to Madrid or Barcelona. Okay, okay, fine, it's fine. <laughs> but it's important to come to Granada <laughs> and to visit me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, questions? Certainly a lot of questions. Um, your case of Immaculata in Spain, it looked like she had been on a ventilator for eight years, the woman, and I was just wondering if there was something specific that occurred that led to her making that decision that after eight years, you know, she had it. There was something else that happened in Spain with other patients or, and, or anything medical that happened with her that made her change, decide. Yeah, th this is a very good point because really I don't know. I have asked the doctors the doctors that were uh, caring, taking care of Immaculada, but what has happened? 
because she has been on ventilation for such a long time, and then suddenly she decides, no, I am tired. I don't want to. And they say that it's not clear because she had been um, uh, uh, saying for the last two years, he, he has been speaking about this. So she was, I mean, that she was thinking about this, but uh, she had not taken a clear decision until this moment. So uh, she had expressed this, but she had not done an advanced directive. So it was not clear about this. And at one moment she decides this, and I, and I mean, I mean that the doctors are not telling me completely the truth, because probably at what mo because I have to say that Immaculada was in a Catholic hospital. Although, although the, um, the funding of uh, his uh, caring was uh, from the state, uh, it was a Catholic hospital. And probably at, uh, some, at, some mo at one moment, she began to say, I want to be disconnected. And somebody told him, we cannot do that. And I think. And then she takes the decision to invite the, journal, the, the press and to give a talk about uh, her decision. And, the, and this is the starting point of all the debate. But I agree with you. It's, it sounds strange. But she, she, was, she was clearly capable, because she was evaluated by two independent psychiatrists about capacity. But I don't know, really. That, that was after Terry Schiavo, right? And this was before, after. Right? You may have been new, having seen that news. Uh, probably. Uh, th there were. Um, the, the debate in Spain in the last five years about these topics has been very intense. And maybe that uh, she was influenced by the Ramon San Pedro case, or the, the movie, or when it was, uh, there was a, a lot of cases in, the, in this time. I, I, don't, I don't know how to say. Did, uh, with, with the Immaculata case, um, did you have the politicians trying to take advantage of it for their own benefit the way we did here with the Terry Schiavo case? Well, um, I have to say first that the, the first re reaction of politicians was, we cannot do that. This was the first reaction. But after, uh, some people, me, for example, and others, began to call, I mean, that is not so clear that we cannot do that. Because my opinion and the opinion of others like me were, this is, oh sorry, this is allowed by, by the law. So they began to change the politicians. And they, and they helped the, 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 the decision of, of Immaculata at the end. Um, they take advantage of this, you know. A politician, by definition, take advantage always of these type of things. But I mean that in this, in, in this case was in favor of, uh, of the liberty, of the freedom of a, of a patient. And it was fine in this case. For example, in the case of the Leganes, of the palliative sedation, the politicians were, because uh, there was a fight, a, a ideological fight behind, because the doctors and the hos hospital of Leganes were members of the left wing. And the politicians in Madrid were members of the right wing. And so under, behind, the debate about palliative sedation was also a political question. And it was a pity. Because this is to use the patience and the suffering of people for ideological debate. And this is not fine. This is not moral, my opinion. I don't know. I, I am going to, to follow one, two, three, and four. OK. I just was wondering if you made a distinction between um, physical suffering and existential suffering, if there's something that if someone, because like with Ramon San Pedro, you could argue he wasn't in pain. He was, he couldn't feel his body. The, yeah. His brain was completely active. He was very social. Like yeah. he was, his family cared for him. He was in, you know, like he was in an environment, um, but he was suffering existentially and that, that was his issue. He couldn't. Like psycho, his pain, which you, it's hard sometimes because I don't know why I want to make the distinction between psychological and physical pain because I think that they're 
Yeah. I think there's just pain, but I find that in a lot of these yeah. decisions, people make that distinction. I'm wondering what what your committee thought or what you think. Yeah, that's very important. I mean, well, you, you can say physical, this so physical, psychological, psychological, or existential, or existential or spiritual suffering. It is no easy to differentiate. But for example, today I, I, I mean I mean that is is not uh, acceptable, is not acceptable in most of the cases to accept that um, a patient is asking me to help him or her to die because he's suffering physical pain. There are some cases because it's difficult to control pain in some cases, but most of the cases we can have a very good control of the pain. And so, and, and, and this is related with other thing that in one of the sessions of your master you were discussing about this, and I am going to give my opinion. It's about this war. What is dignity? And you told, Dignity is not a, a very clear word. In fact, you can read, a, there is an article by Ruth Maplin in the British Medical Journal. Uh, dignity is not a useful, it's something like that. It's a useless, it's a useless I, I disagree with that. Because I, I think it's a very use, useful concept. But I have to explain how to understand the concept of dignity. Because the problem with the concept of dignity is that dignity you have to, to use the concept in three different sense of or levels. There are three different ways of understanding the concept of dignity or to use the concept of dignity. The first, dignity is a formal concept. This is Kant. So what we are saying about human beings is that they have dignity. This means just that they cannot be used only as means, but also as ends. This is the categorical principle. But this is just formal. Because mm, Kant is not speaking about, well, but what is that? Kant is saying, no. So this is like a globe, like a globe. I don't have here my gloves. Wait. So the question is that the formal concept of dignity, this is like a, like a play, like a theater play. <laughs> here it is. The formal concept of dignity is this. Now the problem is, which is the best hand to give content to this globe. So what that really means to treat the persons with dignity? What is that? I can say that, uh, of course, I say that uh, persons have dignity and can say it's because they are, why? Why they have dignity in this sense? And um, Kant will say because they, are, they have reason, they have rationality. And this is the difference with the animals, for example. So you can, from a Kantian perspective, you cannot say that animals have dignity in this sense because they are not rational. We can discuss this, of course. For example, in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the English tradition, uh, really the concept of, li of dignity is more vinculated not, not to rationality, but to emotions. For example, in Hume, the, the point is to have or not to have feelings, to have or not uh, the capacity to experiment pain. Who is, who is experimenting pain is able to feel and then has dignity. And this is the open door to, to, to the um, vindication of uh, uh, animal rights. But this is a formal content. Now, we can discuss what is dignity with content. I, I am going content, material, 
So what is, what is to respect the dignity of the person, really? Well, now there is a general agreement, I can say that, that is, for example, to respect human rights. So the, 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 the way to respect, to give, to re the best hand now, the best hand about dignity, the best hand to give content to the idea of dignity is respecting human rights. Probably uh, in the next century, we will have other contents. And the last is, this is for others, for others, for the people. And the first level is dignity. for me. So how can I be respect in my dignity? This is my question. I am the only one who can decide when I am respect with dignity. And this connects with mm, what you were uh, asking. So nobody can say to the others, you are not suffering. No, 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 I have to say that. If I am suffering, from a physical, psychological, or spiritual point of view. Okay? I have uh, one, two, three, and four. Just quickly, the new law on therapeutic obstinacy, has this been taken advantage of by physicians in hospitals, and has there been resistance from patients or patients' families? Yes. Yes, yes, of course. I mean, I mean this. So, uh, this law establishes a framework. But now the debate continues. So not all the funding, but I mean that, uh, uh, for example, many, many, many doctors until now, or even, even probably now, until now, uh, the conflict means that, well, I think this is futile. But if the family wants, I am not going to look for problems. So I am, I am going to continue with the me mechanical ventilation until the end. So th this is the way that many physicians have been thinking until now. And probably even now, in many cases, are doing that. But I mean that the framework is allowing them to, to, to take this decision in another way, feeling, because, because mm, feeling more safe. And, and, and I mean, that this is going to change the, the, the real uh, way in which uh, Spanish and Andalusian doctors are taking decisions. Thank you for the fascinating lecture. And, uh, I don't think I'm alone in saying that your ability to express the concept is crystal clear, so you should, you should be completely confident. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Um, to, uh, quick, quickly, uh, the framework you were describing for euthanasia yeah. specifically requires that it is performed by a healthcare professional. Yeah. Is there a civil or criminal procedure legislation um, uh, in, in the event that it is somebody who is not a healthcare professional with a relationship with that individual. Yes. Yes, because you know that the, 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 the penal code is not speaking about professionals. This was an introduction of the, of the Andalusian law, a definition of euthanasia. But if, for example, is, um, uh, the, you saw the, the doctor that was uh, uh, sued uh, and, and was uh, uh, punished uh, as a criminal offense uh, in the, the only case, he was a doctor. But he could be not a doctor. Because the criminal code doesn't uh, state that it has to be a professional. This is a proposal of the Andalusian law. Understood. Okay. And I'm sorry, one more. Is, yeah. the, uh, uh, is, is there any kind of address about resources in terms of therapeutic obstinacy? I, I would assume with your, your shifting interest to public health framework, yeah. there is a big discussion here about individual rights versus public health rights, mm. and based on the circumstances of the environment, yeah. whether to provide those resources changes when resources become more constrained, yeah. right? So if in the example you were just describing, if an individual wants the care, even though it's futile, if there are more resources, the doctor can say, okay, we'll give it to them, you know, yeah. to write up the years. But then if there's a public health emergency or something like that, they would cut it, and, and there would be and there would be less liability concerns for that doctor. Yeah, this is very, very interesting. Very interesting. Well, I I, I'm, I I like I like to separate the uh, 
the, oblig the professional obligations of doctors in relation with what is indicated or not indicated because it is futile. I mean, this is one part. And the second part is that these decisions have economic consequences, always. But I would say that you cannot decide if a treatment is indicated or not um, with the argument that it is too expensive. So the reason why I am deciding to uh, limit the treatment is because, because it is not uh, indicated. That's all. Although I, I know that if I consider that the treatment is not indicated and I am doing it, I am not doing limitation, it has, a, for example, in a, in a public, in a, in a statal system, has very important consequences that I am not, I am wasting the money in an inappropriate way. But m the main reason is not this. This is a secondly argument. The first is, which are my obligations as professional? You know, although I think that it, uh, this all debates in a crisis, in a crisis moment, will go more involved with the economical arguments. I mean, so politicians again will have here their paper, to, to the, the role to play, of course, sure. I, I will tell you in one year, because the, the Spanish situation is critical now. I was thinking of not your last case. Six or eight years. Could it have come at some point that she felt she was an incumbent on her relatives? Coming to visit her all the time and she totally unable, she's in a gurney full time. And I'm relating about well, four years ago at the Med Campus, all the people a guy came from Texas and was talking about his patient, all spoke of it. And they all, they lived at home with their wives, they all contemplated suicide throughout. And they, and it didn't indicate how long it was since they had the stroke. And here's someone who had totally incapacitated for eight years. Could she have said, hey, my family has really got a lot in their plate? I, I don't know if I, if I can well, follow. She says, I don't want to encumber my family because here I am. In a vegetarian state. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, for example, that in, in the United States, you, you know that the, the Latin culture, uh, and, and even in other cultures different to the more liberal uh, uh, culture in the United, in, uh, uh, coming in the United States, and even in the Ang Anglo Saxon countries, uh, the family is very, very, very important in Spain, and even for other cultures and, and, and the family plays a very important role. This is the reason why all these decisions are so so difficult because um, sometimes you, you have to fight uh, against a huge amount of values, feelings uh, where the, the families are involved in the, in the care of the, of the patient. And so it's, it's not easy. I mean, will be the last I, one. Yeah, I have a question about the um, assisted suicide. Now, you're from Spain, and there, I understand, there's a lot of um, different legislation all over Europe. We have the Netherlands, we have um, Belgium, we have the assisted suicide on legal in, um, in Switzerland, which is not part of the European Union, but anyway, in Europe. So the question for me is, has there ever been an attempt on the European legislative side in Strasbourg or in Brussels to, um, to form a more um, sanctuary for this, especially since the first charter, the first article of the charter is called dignity. Yeah, yeah. Very, very, good, very good question. Very difficult, very difficult. You know, you know I, I, I mean that probably there are, you, you have, you have the debates between the different states here in the United States and, 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 to, and to find an agreement at the federal level is not easy. But in Europe, wow, <laughs> because the traditions are so different, the language are so, is so different. The cult for example, 
I have been uh, involved in some discussions in Brussels about this, in workshops with different European countries about this. And it's so difficult, for example, uh, uh, the Eastern countries, the way of thinking is so different to the Western countries, and the Southern countries are so different to the Northern countries that it's very different to find an agreement. For example, this, this, uh, this uh, recommendation that I showed you about uh, advanced directives in the Council of Europe, it took four years to reach to a single document that is telling so simple things, but it's important because now many countries have to develop advanced directives. They, they have not do, uh, yet, but for other countries, is clearly insufficient because they are far away of, of, of this regulation. So it's, it's, very, it's, it's very difficult in Europe to, to, to do this. And well, the, the point of, of the Netherlands and Belgium allowing euthanasia, you know that uh, the situation in Europe is Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, euthanasia. Okay? Assisted suicide in the Netherlands and in Switzerland. And now the United Kingdom is going to probably regulate assisted suicide. So this is the situation. So how to deal with this question in an environment, European environment, where you have the southern or the eastern countries that are completely against this. So it's very difficult, really. OK. And I mean, this is the last question. Um, I think uh, in America, say 50 years ago or 60 years ago, most doctors would continue treatment no matter what, and a lot of the battles in bioethics were to, uh, for families to get their doctors to stop treating. Yeah. And that, that's, that's happened. I think, and I, what I'm beginning to see, and this is anecdotal perhaps, not, not research, is that we've gone the other direction, where there are now families who are very unhappy that the doctors are trying to talk them into taking their yeah. patient, their loved ones off life support. And this is why I think it's a very tricky thing. It was one of your question marks. When the family wants it, the doctor thinks it's futile. But uh, there, there has to be a real accommodation. I mean, and there are also, we have religious exemptions. If you're, if you're a certain religion, you can be left on life support even if the doctor feels it's futile because uh, you have a religious exemption. And uh, I, just, I just wondered if, if there's any sense of that. Did that happen in Spain? Is that, you know, I mean, it's a Catholic country. It may be a very different situation. I mean, well, uh, I have to say that probably the situation in Spain is that we, we have both problems now. So, so you, you told, 10 years ago, the problem was that uh, doctors won't wanted to continue, and the families were saying, stop, stop, stop. And now we have the, the contrary problem, because many doctors want to stop, and the families are saying, no, no, no. So we have both problems in Spain. So there are situations in, in which doctors are doing therapeutic obstinacy. But this is easier, because now the framework is more clear. But the, the, the other problem is not so easy. I mean, it's the same that in, in, in here. And re religious exceptions, the framework, the general framework that does not contemplate this, uh, that does think about this. But I mean that fetal decision, as, as all decision making in medicine, has to be very prudent, a very de deliberative at the end. And, and I can justify exceptions for many things. You can do, for example, you think, in a, in, a, in a teenager with um, um, not Hodgkin lymphoma, terminal, and then um, you decide to stop uh, to put blood. OK? And until now, you have been using blood because this helps the, 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 this boy to, to recover. But now, you, you begin to consider that it is a futile, a futile treatment because he's terminal. I am going not to give blood to him. But then the family tells you, tells you, please, we know that we are at the end. 
but we have to wait because his father is in the United States and he has to come here. Can you put blood again? You know that it is futile from a strictly clinical sense of view. But I mean that you and me, we could use blood again. One week to give the father to come and to, to say goodbye. But what if in the next week the mother tells you, oh, the blood was so fine. We are going to use it again. What would you say? I could say I'm sorry. No. Because we are at the end. And we have to prepare for the end. Not to give blood again and again and again and again. So we can use exceptions. But we, we have to be able to justify exceptions. And one exception ends with that ex exception. I cannot prolong that. Okay, that.